not separate any particular capitalist economy from the rest of the world. So the post-World War II U.S. Uh, and, uh, led boom was in many ways based on super exploitation in the third world. Remember, this was an era of all sorts of wars and great instability in the, in the post-colonial world, and a lot of it had to do with uh, ensuring the flow of, of cheap commodities. Copper from Chile, tin from uh, Bolivia, oil from the Middle East, bauxite from from Indonesia and so supporting all sorts of repressive regimes to ensure the this flow is just of a fantasy commodities. that we're hearing here. What, what we, we've seen is that the instability has now moved to the center. You have these austerity programs that are now being imposed on the Western nations themselves, whereas in the 80s and 90s they were being imposed on the periphery because the demand is always the same by those who control the economy that the, they need to have their profits. They they need to have the wealth flow upward. So what we see is a system that is breaking down. Um, but again, I don't think this is anything historically, if we're talking about the last couple of centuries, unique what is going on in this moment in terms of financialization, right. in terms right. of right. I, I, economic I, 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 I like what Tom had to say about fantasy, but I'm, let's go back to Richard first before we go to the break. Okay, I, I've lived in Asia for most of the last 25 years, and I've watched Asia be transformed by the economic boom that's taken place. But the boom here has occurred for one reason and one reason only. It's because of the U.S. trade deficit. Mm. The U.S. trade deficit grew to be $800 billion. That was $2 million a minute. That's what enriched the rest of Asia. That's what made Asia boom. And that trade deficit was paid for on credit. Now that brings us back to our credit crisis. Now this economic paradigm. Credit expanded every year in the United States from 1947 until 2009. And when it cracked started to correct, then the crisis started. So we're now at the end of this 40, 50 year debt fueled economic paradigm and it looks like it's going to implode. What do you think about that, Tom? Earlier you said fantasy. Go ahead. And it will take Asia down well, with We it. heard from Arun a lot of, we heard just a lot of a rehashed dime store Marxism and it doesn't stand up to the facts. Let's look at some actual facts on trade flows. Take the American economy. Does a m much greater trade with Canada next door. That's the largest uh, undefended border in the world, and over $600 billion a year of trade goes back and forth across that border. Fact of the matter is that people in poor countries, in Africa, for example, suffer from a lack of trade, not too much trade. So this whole periphery core. Uh, as I say, dime store Marxism just doesn't stand up to analysis of the facts. And if you look at India, and I recommend Gurcharan Das's very good book. All right, India, Tom, I'm going to jump in here, and I want you to continue this point reform, after a short break. After that break, we'll continue our discussion on capitalism. Stay with our team. the top 1% of the population held about 20% of the wealth. That was a historic low. By the late 1980s, barely a decade later, it was up to 35%. And recently, we are now above gilded age levels. The 400 richest families in the country, in America, have more wealth than 50% of the population, than 150 million people. And we, we need to really understand, we can talk about the neoliberal moment in terms of deregulation, flexibility, Flexibilization, uh, trade liberalization, personal responsibility. We can talk about the ideology and tools of it, but really what it is is about a massive upward transfer of wealth because even though the ideology is market fundamentalism, that government should not intervene in markets, government always intervenes in markets, um, and it depends on whose side they're intervening on. During the Keynesian moment, you did have some intervention on the side of labor, but now what it is, it's on the side of capital. So with all the very various debt crises, mm -hmm. such as the Mexican uh, peso crisis in the 1980s, the East Asian financial crisis, and the credit crisis now, uh, we see government intervening to aid corporations to ensure that bondholders are, are kept whole. That, that is what this is about. I think we need to do away with the fantasy of the free market uh, mm -hmm. that some uncomfortable purchase like to peddle. Okay, Richard, if I can go back to you in Bangkok, I mean, Arun brings up a very interesting point, is that governments around the world are propping up capitalism because capitalism is really to the benefit of corporations and not to labor and not to civil society in general. Is that how capitalism has changed, let's say, since the 1980s? Well, during my, my lifetime, it seems to me that everyone's become much richer. Uh, of course, the income disparity has become greater, but as credit has expanded to 50